guys and welcome to another new episode of Young with Ram. This area is where you ask the questions and I answer them, more or less. Well, actually, I think I uh, answer most of the questions, even the most um, strange ones. <laughs> um, well, this week ha this week has been interesting. It's the first week since a long, long, long time. Um, where, I'm, where I have not played uh, War Thunder, mostly at all. Um, the challenges for the Closet Beat are destroying historical battles, to be honest. Um, I don't know what to do, I can't have fun in that game mode anymore until they stop it. <laughs> Simply put, uh, well, December is soon, so hopefully that is coming soon as well. Also, I'm, try I'm holding for 1.37 which is bringing a lot of new goodies and new stuff and probably will um, bring back the excitement right now it's just getting furious to the, with the game and the ga players and the really I'm, I don't play a game to, to, to get um, angry and annoyed and um, to yell at other people I mean everyone has a chance to and, and the right to play the game the way they see fit and I'm no one to tell anyone how he should play the game but really at times it becomes extremely 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 offensive not just annoying offensive but whatever uh, as you know of course because you have been seeing what I have been uploading for this week I have been playing um, Wargame Erlan Battle also, I want to um, address the fact that we didn't uh, put a podcast uh, last Friday. That's because my ISP decided to shit on me uh, during last week and Bismarck and I couldn't um, get along at the same moment and at the same time. So, no worries. Uh, next week there will be a Q&A as every other week. Um, my ISP allowing, of course. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, other than that, well, you know I have been playing Wargame uh, war game Erlan Battle, so the gameplay is from, from that game. I'm surprised uh, of the good reception these videos have had. Uh, pretty nice um, views. For a game that's not War Thunder, of course. I mean, this channel is mostly about War Thunder and other games are more, more or less accessory, so... It's kind of surprising and cool uh, that you guys enjoy this game because I'm enjoying it as well. As for all those of you who have asked me if this uh, is a game worth getting, absolutely, totally, yes. I mean, there's no way around that. It's excellent. Uh, this is, I mean, I can't believe I'm saying I'm having fun with a real-time strategy game. I have never have uh, had it. Um, since the very early beginnings of uh, of the genre, uh, I wasn't good at it. I mean, I'm not good at microing. I'm getting better at uh, keeping track of uh, several things at the same moment in the in the map, but still, my macro is not good. And it's never going to be because it has never been, and I have given it a lot of tries. But this game is is is. Uh, it's amazing because even if you don't do a whole lot of micro, if you do a little bit of it, and it's of course w done the right way, um, all the rest is about tactics. I mean, it tactics matter more than micro, and that's what I want in a strategy game. Uh, and I'm having tons of, tons of fun. I mean, I'm winning, I'm losing, I'm destroying enemies, I'm getting destroyed, uh, but even when I get destroyed, I have fun. So. Really, uh, whoever likes the, this style of games should give it a try. It's not easy, uh, as of course all games I enjoy is kind of a um, topic of mine. Uh, <laughs> you have to learn it. You have to watch instructional videos about this uh, this game. Um, actually, I'm lately I'm playing with a Rapac, which is a group of people who are in the same clan as uh, Raptor. I uh, ICBM, which is another YouTuber who puts up a lot of videos about real-time strategy games, uh, as this one, uh, Wargame Erlan Battle. Uh, also, he puts a lot of uh, Wargame uh, European Escalation and Men of War. Uh, all of them games I like. Uh, Men of War I love. The problem is I can't play it. It's one of those games where micro matters most, more, more than strategy. So it's a game that I would love to play, but I can't because I simply can't micro that much uh, and that well, of course. 
but uh, yeah, I learned a lot in, in that channel. Also, Vulcan HD Gaming, I think it's another one. Um, the thing is, you want to see stuff, you want to learn. I mean, this is not a simple game. This is not like your real-time strategy game when you third the opposition and just uh, massing numbers and throwing them to, to the enemy is going to work. You really have to work on your strategy. Um, and I'm having a lot of fun, so really, if you have the chance, get it. Um, there's an expansion coming soon. Um, also, there's another uh, new uh, war game coming, which is uh, Red Dragon, I think, in the Far East, which is bringing a new loot, uh, a lot of new goodies, uh, which look amazing, all of them. Um, so really, yeah, if you like this style of games, give it a try. Uh, it's, it's going to be fun, I promise. So, well, enough for intro. Let's go for some questions. It's about time. Uh, first one. <laughs> well, the first one is about a question I didn't understand <laughs> in the last Jump with Ram. Is the, did you ever hoist? Uh, I didn't know what that meant. And seems that it means uh, if I do weight lifting. No, I don't. I actually do very few exercises and I should do more. But gyms are boring. <laughs> As heck, I can't get over that. But really, it's reaching a point where I should start getting more exercise and I'm looking into ways to do that um, but no I don't hoist I never hoisted and probably never will I'm not a huge fan of um, I mean I would like to be more or less ripped I mean well muscled and, and stuff but not too much uh, I'm not a fan of people with a lot of muscles but well and I wouldn't love to be, to be that way of course but yeah I, I still work on, on myself a little bit more and probably I will but the problem is how <laughs> because seems are so damn boring uh, next question hey Ram if you like air battle uh, try R-U-S-E Rus. it's by the same makers and it's a World War 2 real-time strategy game yeah, the problem is um, that it shares a lot of common things with um, other real-time strategy games, which, I, as I said, I can't play because m my macro sucks. Um, War game I'm enjoying because it has such a huge uh, strategy component and tactical component. If you are good at tactics, uh, you are going to make a good deal of good th things in this game, and in other RTSs, is not the case. I, I don't really go, think I'm going to try a lot of um, um, real-time strategy games other than this series, because, as I said, I'm loving it. Um, just because the genre in, on itself doesn't su suit me, the way I play. As I said, this game is a very particular case. Um, but mm, no, I don't think I'm going to try any others, to be honest. Next question. Um, Ram, do you you need to watch Area 88? Maybe I would if I knew what it was. <laughs> Next question. Ram, why does Gajin hate Grumman planes? Uh, I don't think they hate Grumman planes. Uh, my guess is that you are asking me um, because of the Hellcat. Um, yeah, well, the Hellcat is really poor at the moment. It has some... Actually, they know the, what the problem is. I don't know when they are going to fix it, but the problem with the Hellcat is that at low speeds, the engine doesn't rev up the way it should. And especially at low altitudes, because the supercharger is not working really as it should. So if you are low and slow, you are going to die because the plane would, <laughs> won't uh, accelerate or climb. Uh, it's really gimped. Uh, but I'm guessing they are going to fix it. As for the others, well, the beer cut for a while was pretty broken. Right now is actually underperforming a little, a little bit because I think the thing should turn much better than what it does. Um, but I still think it's a very good plane. And the Wildcat, I love that thing. I mean, at level 5, uh, F4, F3 is, is great. The only problem with that plane is that it doesn't have a good roll rate, but the historical one didn't either. Uh, but at level 5, uh, Wildcat is a really respectable plane. So I don't think Ajin uh, hates Grumman, Grumman planes. I just think the Hellcat is broken. The Bearcat is not really mm, where it should be, in turning at least. 
but um, still it's a powerful plane and the wildcat is is really good at least for me i don't know um yeah next question Please do a review on the MiG-3. I love it to bits, even though it has bad armament. Your thoughts on it, mate? Well, I have flown the MiG-3, not a lot, to be honest. Uh, I will do a plane review when I restart the plane review series. I'm waiting for 1.37 to, to come out. Um, thoughts on it? It can't turn worth a crap. <laughs> uh, for a Russian plane, it's really good at high altitude. I mean, it's, it signs over 4,000 meters. It's really good. Um, decent boom and summer, but yeah, weak armament. That's probably the mo the biggest problem. Still, at close range, those scash <laughs> um, and the heavy machine gun do the job really well. It's a plane I like, but it's not a plane for new players. Um, requires a lot more than just uh, turning and a lot of people turning it right? and it's not a turner at all has very good performance is really good at high altitude decent at boom and zoom only problem is the we uh, weapons it's a very powerful plane also very, really good performance in speed so you are going to catch up with almost anything so it's, it's, it's a really good plane uh, I, I'm not surprised if you like it because really it's very good but it requires a very particular playstyle that for level 4 not a lot of people have so yeah that's the only problem with the plane next question um, Foxu, this is not a question. He says, Ram likes Divisita, un subscriber. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not something I would see to watch the whole series again right now. But it's, um, I mean, it's, it's an anime I have a lot of very good memories of. And it was very funny to watch. So, yeah, well, this is the way it is. Sorry. Um, next one. Another comment. War game Erlan Battle for me is one of the toughest games to play online. Honestly, I don't know. Um, at this moment, I have played it quite a bit. Not for a long time, of course, but during this last week, I have played it quite a bit. I don't think it's tough to play online. But, well, maybe against someone who's really good. Yeah, it is. But against someone who is really, really good, it's going to be tough always in any game. Um, of course, you can argue that I have a proper mindset for this game. Um, it's, it's, again, it's all about tactics. And other than simulators, I love war games. And I have played a lot of them in the past. Turned based war games. That's the only thing here. Real time strategy has never been my stuff. Um, I played a lot of combat missions back in the day. All of them. Combat Mission, the first one. Combat Mission, Barbarossa to Berlin, the second one. Um, Combat Mission, Africa Corps, the third one. The one with Mother Weaponry, I didn't. Uh, back then, I simply didn't have the computer to run it. And uh, I think I didn't lose too much, to be honest. Um, and you really learn a lot of about uh, combat tactics in, in Combat Mission. A lot. Um, so probably that will... That has helped me to um, do well in, in war game because it's all about tactics. Again, uh, you can be the fastest clicker in the world, then if you don't apply tactics, you are going to be massacred. So um, yeah, the, that's that's the probably most important thing. Um, the th the thing is tough. It has a very tough learning curve. But again, maybe it's because I'm a, I'm a nerd. I'm a freak of of weaponry and armaments, and and not just about World War II, also about the Cold War. So most of the weapon systems that are in the game, I know. So I know what to expect from them, and I know how to use them right because I know how they did in real life. The game on itself is not 100% realistic, but it follows realism really well. So if you apply real life tactics to the game, you're going to do well. So yeah, uh, toughest, I don't know. Uh, tough, well, it is tough, but yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> Next question. Hey Ram, what are your thoughts about the Dornier 335 uh, fail 
the arrow. Historically, um, its performances, etc. Um, would it would be a good premium plane for the Germans? Well, yeah, certainly it would be a great. I don't know why premium. It would be a great German plane. Period. Of course, it was just a prototype. You can argue that being a prototype maybe could be a premium. Yeah. As for the plane on itself, I think it was a wasted chance for Germany. Kind of fortunately, of course, because no one wants Germany to win that war. Um, was a very innovative design. It was very advanced um, in many ways. I think it would be have been a really powerful bomber destroyer. It's one of those planes that when you look at it, and when you read uh, people's description on it and and how it flew, actually, uh, if you have Eric Brown, uh, Wings of the Luftwaffe. Play a book. He flew it, and he has some um, descriptions on about the plane. Um, it, it had really exceptional performance, but it wasn't maneuverable. I mean, it was a first order. It was the archetypical German destroyer, a heavy fighter, um, and it's one of those planes that when you look at you think about, wow, it's really lucky that the Germans didn't pay attention to this idea before. Because with that kind of plane in 1943, and it could have happened, I mean, it was not revolutionary technology. The engine, not exactly the same model, but the engine on itself, the DB603, was available in 1943. Um, and the plane could have been used in 1943 had it been developed in time. And alongside the ME262 and many other German planes, uh, when you look at it, you think, wow, <laughs> it's really lucky that Germans didn't pay attention to this model before, because otherwise things could have been much, much, much tougher for uh, the Americans and British over, over Germany uh, while bombing the factories, etc. Um, I think, it, and uh, also in War Thunder, I think it's going to be a really, 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 really good plane. Really. So heavy, so powerful, because it has a lot of power, and also so clean for a twin engine plane, because it doesn't have any wing gondolas for the engines. Might be a Bowman's Home Dream. And also the heavy weaponry, of course, MK-103 cannon, wow, and 20 millimeters on the nose, an option to load uh, more MK-103 MK cannons on the wings. So it can be a really devastating plane. Also excellent performance uh, in speed. Won't be a great climber, but will be very fast. So yeah, I would like, it. I would like to see it in, in War Thunder. Of course, and historically speaking, I think it's one of those planes that really could have changed the way the air battles were fought over Germany during 1943 and 1944 had it come in time. But it didn't. So, well, that's it. Next question. Time for another weird question. I am sure you have noticed that some maps in War Thunder have residential areas. What do you think those people down there think when they see all the crazy air combat above their homes? Um, well, it, I guess they will be thinking that's cool. Unless, of course, one of those planes falls on over them. Also, I think a lot of them will get annoyed and angry at some planes that go over their homes at maybe 50 meters, thinking they are cool because they have rockets and bombs. <laughs> yeah, well, weird question. I don't know how to answer that other than this. Uh, next one. Uh, Ram, any recommendation on how to deal with the M1K in an F4U1C? Uh, after I dive in a way, like you said in the FU plane analysis, but the M1K absolutely seems to absorb it better in a dive than the Corsair. These days I hate battling Japanese at high levels because I always get trolled by the CV machine. How can I handle them in a woman somewhere when they have greater altitude and, and better dive? <sighs> Add some creative comment here about broken planes. Then one case is totally dis is retardedly broken. I'm not surprised if you have problems with the F4U1C. Uh, I guess that thing of the devil. 
Um, there's little you can do. I mean, all you can do is to take your machine to the le to the best and hope the guy who's flying that broken thing is not good. The problem is that the plane is so ridiculously broken that it allows for some extremely weird stuff. How to deal with it? Well, don't mind it. Just think about when it gets fixed, I will have fun. Meanwhile, I'm trying to. Uh, there's little you can do. I mean, the M1K is, alongside the broken fighter, the most broken plane in the game right now. So, little you can do about that, to be honest. Next question. And this is a comment about the King Cobra. Uh, he's asking about the dive of the King Cobra. And, um, well, particularly the question is Does the King Cobra have that much better energy retention than the Focus 190? Well, you have to keep in mind that the King Cobra, King Cobra was one of the most aerodynamic planes of World War II. It was the um, successor to the P43. Thirty-nine, sorry, the Era Cobra, which on turn was again one of the most aerodynamic planes of World War II. The problem with the Era Cobra was that Bell was trying to make such a efficient machine from the aerodynamic point of view that they took the prototype to the NACA, which was the antecessor to the NASA, uh, was uh, the Institute of uh, Aerodynamics of of the United States back then, and um, between the recommendations of the NACA to change the, the plane to suit to a better aerodynamic shape, they included one which was remove the turbocharger. And they did remove the turbocharger and they killed the plane. <laughs> the King Cobra is like what the um, Era Cobra should have been. A really efficient aerodynamic clean plane with a quite powerful engine and um, really good design. You have to keep in mind that, uh, that energy retention is really related to two things. Uh, in straight lines, if you are turning, it's a whole different world. But if you are zooming, diving, zooming again, etc., um, the performance of your plane goes around two parameters. First is weight. We have spoken about this in a lot of my videos. So weight, the heavier your plane is, the weather is going to dive and zoom. And the second one is aerodynamics. I mean, heavier planes are better because they punch through the air easier. But if you are in a more aerodynamic plane, you will have to use less force to punch through the air as well. And the King Cobra is really aerodynamic. So don't be surprised if the King Cobra dives so well. It doesn't dive better than the Focus 180. That's the thing. Um, red lines much before than the Focus 180. But if the Focus 90 goes for a very high speed dive, the King Cobra what can do is to go for a shallower dive to keep his speed below the red line and just wait for you to level up and cut your corners and catch you down there. It's not that it dives better, it's that it's very efficient in the dive. And if you try to use max speed uh, dives, it's going to catch up because it's very aerodynamic. Uh, I really don't think the King Cobra is broken. I have flown it quite a bit and I think it's really a good plane, nothing else. Uh, the only thing is that people really are surprised by a plane they don't really know. It's a very unknown plane in the West because it was used by the Soviets mostly. But it was a really exceptional plane back in the day. The only, well, the reason it didn't make it into the US Air Forces, I think, is because they were short-sighted. And also because the Mustang was in full swing production and it didn't make too much, too much sense to add even other fighters to the, to the standard line. I mean, they had the Thunderbolt, they had the Mustang, they had the Lightning. So why another one? I mean, that, I mean, it was very good, but the Mustang was doing really well and so the Thunderbolt. Um, but really the King Cobra was a really, really good plane. I don't think it's broken at all, at least from what I have tried it. And I have fought ag against it and I have flown it and I think it's perfectly okay. It has a lot of nice things to it and it's great aerodynamics is one of them. Laminar flow wings in a really, really aerodynamic shape. So it's not surprising it has a good energy retention. It's not really heavy, but I mean, it's not a lightweight either. I mean, I think it's maybe 3,800 kilograms of plane, which is not that far away from the Focus 180, which is 4,000 kilograms. So 
really, I do think the only problem here is that the print is good and people don't expect it to be so good. Because the King Cobra has the stigma attached to it that is the successor to a very crappy plane as the Air Cobra was. But I think it's just a case of a very good plane that people don't... The same way everyone is like crying because the Mustang is not good and they expected it the, to be the Terminator of the skies while the P-51 is really good in the game but people simply expect things from that plane that the, the plane doesn't deliver because it was exceptional for what it did but some things it didn't do well I think this is the opposite, people don't know the King Cobra they don't have any hype attached to the plane they don't expect it to be good and when they find out how good it is they are surprised and they think it's broken no it's not broken it was really good and of course it offers things that suit for what people think is good in historical battles so it has a very good climb rate and people really the focus on the climb rate in historical battles oh my gosh no it's not about climb rate it's how, about how you use your energy you have to climb to use energy but you don't to, need to be the highest one anyway in, I think it, the, the thing here is that people don't know the plane, they don't know it, they don't know what it's about and they think it's like the Era Cobra with a little more power, and it's not, I mean, the King Cobra is what the Era Cobra should have been, and never was. So, yep, yeah, next question. Ram, will you play other nations, nations yet when you get them? Ones that are worth flying, but not ones like the F-80 when you so just sit club Germans all day. Oh, yes, of course, eventually when I make it to the levels where I can purchase it yet, I will purchase it and I will try it and I will probably make videos about it. The thing is that lately I'm not playing War Thunder that much, so it's going to take a while. But yeah, I will, I will. I'm actually looking, for, looking forward to the Meteors, I'm just one level away from them, and I'm also not that far away from unlocking the first year, uh, American ones. The problem, again, at least with the American ones, is that, yeah, the F-80 is a silk lobby machine, there's no way around that. Um, so, well, but, but I will try it, of course, because it's going to be interesting to, to try it out, to see where it signs and where it lacks and to put up some videos. Uh, of course, yes, I will try them. Next question. Ram, uh, could you please explain in detail uh, how to deal with the wobbling in BF109 uh, Fs and Gs? One advice I g always get is to use keyboard, but it seems I'm stupid. <laughs> I'm too stupid to get it right. This wobbling took a weight at the fun I had up t until now. Um, my answer, use keyboard. <laughs> no, really, it's the only way you are going to to go around that. And it's not just the Focus 190 which has that problem. The Focus 190 also has several allied planes also have this wobbling. Uh, it's related with the way Instructor messes up. It's as simple as that. If you are using mouse, Instructor is the thing that's flying your plane. You are not flying your plane. Instructor is and is trying to follow your instructions. Um, how to deal with wobble? As soon, as soon as the wobbling start, uh, try to roll the plane to one side, other side, whatever. Roll a little bit, use a little bit of turning, even use rather keys. As soon as you touch a key, a control key, one that controls uh, ailerons or elevator or even rudder, instructor stops making inputs. You are the one flying the plane. So get used to use uh, keyboard most of the time, uh, at least while in, in, in combat. Of course, mouse is necessary, so now and then Wobbling is going to mess you a little bit up. But if you react quickly with keyboard, you can feel more or less keep things steady up to an extent. I mean, Wobbling is a problem even for me, and I use keyboard most of the time. But really, it's not that hard to keep it under control. You only need to use keys. Um, as soon as the wobbling starts, use keyboard. Important. Because the wobbling is caused by instructor and keyboard simply stops the instructor giving commands to your to your plane. So it's the best advice I can give you. It's the only way around that. So yeah, use keyboard. <laughs> Next question. 
Uh, yes, I start, uh, w started watching you Ram and I got to say some really awesome videos. Well, thank you. Also with War Thunder, what would be your favorite aircraft historically and why? Well, I have it re re repeated it a lot of times, but of course they are newcomers and they don't know. Uh, my favorite plane historically is the Fukur 590. Um, as for the why, it's the first World War II plane I put my eyes on and it really caught my imagination. And later, when I tried it out in flight simulators, it actually gr grew on me. I mean, it's not an easy plane to fly. Um, it's not really... Especially in real simulators. I mean, in, in War Thunder it's more or less... It's easier. I, I think it's easier to fly focus than it is in, in War Thunder. But in real simulators with stalls and spins and etc., you really need to be very careful because that thing stalls really quickly. It has a very sudden snap roll to the left if you stall it that can really destroy your ability to win a fight. So you have to be really careful to fly it. Um, I don't, I don't know if it grew on me because I like the way it flies, boom and zoom, or maybe is that I like boom and zoom because it's the way the focal phone and this would be flown. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, is the chicken before the egg or the egg before the chicken? Who knows? All I know is uh, it's a plane that since I was maybe nine years old, caught my eye and my imagination and since then uh, I simply can stop loving it. I think it was a brilliant piece of engineering, a masterful, masterful design and I think probably the best uh, fighter of World War II, all along the series of course. Um, the early Antons established superiority and they were the best fighter in the world since 1941 until 1943. Then in 1944, with the introduction of the Thunderbolt and the um, P-51, um, it actually suffered quite a little bit. <coughs> but when the Dora series came in, oh boy, those things kicked ass. And the TA-152, the end line of the Focus for any series, uh, it was as an exceptional machine. So I think it runs really high up there with the best fighters of World War II, if not the best. So yeah, that's why I love it. And also, I like the looks. I mean, it's such a mean looking machine. You look at it and it's like... It's designed to kill. It's designed to be aggressive. It's, it's just all about it. I like it so much. Uh, next question. Ram, have you been playing KSP recently? If yes, how far did you get in the game since last time you put up a video on it? No, actually I'm not playing it a lot, to be honest. Actually I haven't played it for maybe a month and a half. Um, as for how far I got in the game since the last time I tried it out, um, I was still designing planes. I mean, that mod uh, about the advanced aerodynamics and the procedural wings. Oh god, they allow for some really incredible stuff. Um, so I should can go back to it, but really I don't have time. I mean, I'm, I have time for what I have and War Game is taking a lot of my time. Another game I will, go, I will mention in the last part of the video is also taking a lot of my time. Um, War Thunder was taking a lot of my time, but hopefully, hopefully, we'll take it soon again. And um, I'm still playing Automation, I'm still playing Faster Than Light now and then. So there are a lot of uh, games that I'm playing, but no, KSP hasn't been for a while. I will come back to it. I mean, it's a great, great, great and very fun game to, to play. But right now, I'm not playing it. Next question. Next question is, wow, another one about favorite planes. Ram, what is your favorite plane visually? Not a focal fan any. <laughs> Mine is the P40, something about those stylistic curves on the control surfaces that scream the forties in that plane. I might be in love. So, so, so I see a doctor. Uh, well, if you should see a doctor, I should see a lot of them as well. Um, no, you shouldn't see a doctor. Uh, <laughs> 
favorite playing from the aesthetic point of view that's not the focal fan I need is going to be the Corsair <laughs> has to be that inger inverted could wing that that style I mean it's it's beautiful it's a it's another meaning design I mean it looks mean you look at it and it's like screaming I want to kill something and really that inverted could wing I don't know what is with that but I love that performance wise I would see, think the Thunderbolt ranks higher in my preferences but really for looks and not, if it's not a um, focal find any very few things with a Corsair and I can't think of any right now I, I look I, I know a lot of you guys will say wah blah blah um, P40, P51 is beautiful and Spitfire is beautiful and stylish and whatever I mean the P51 was called the Cadillac of the skies because yes it was a stylish but uh, I'm not into inline planes I mean yeah well yeah I can see it's beautiful it's like aesthetic but it's not it lacks the meaning it lacks the aura of 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 being mean and killing and all that stuff yeah the speedfire is beautiful has some graceful lines whatever but it's still a fighter it should look threatening not beautiful at least for me uh, it's my take at least so i like planes that look mean that look business that look i'm here to kick your ass and seriously things like the P47, the Corsair, the Focus Vanini, wow, oh, oh shit, the Sea um, Fury, uh, those things look mean. I mean, they look like they were designed for what they were designed to kill stuff. And there's kind of an attraction to that. Maybe the one seen a doctor should be me. I don't know, <laughs> but I don't like the stylish kind of stuff in fighters. Yeah, P51, Cadillacs of the Skies. Cool. Yeah, it's a beautiful plane, but doesn't look mean. It doesn't work for me. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that would be it. Next, next question. Ram, do a test flight of the P39K, the Comic Gold Era Cobra. I found it to be as faster accelerating and faster in the power dive than the regular American P39. Not surprising. The Russians. Um, I mean, the, the Russian era cobras were a little special. It's one of those fun stories of World War II. I mean, the P-39 is one of those planes with such a crappy um, a reputation. Uh, deservedly so. I mean, the plane was shit. <laughs> Sorry, but it was. Um, but there's, there needs to be a little differentiation between the American era cobras and the Russian era cobras. Let me explain myself. First of all, the biggest and probably worst problem with the P-39 is that over 3,000 meters it was not a plane. It was a dustbin with wings and it only served to be a target. It simply didn't have any performance up there. It's as simple as that. The Super Star it was not powerful enough to give any power up there. However, in Russia that's not a problem. That was not a problem because the Red Eye Force was a mass flying under 4,000 meters as a rule. Um, Soviet planes and Soviet fighters were used to cover for IL-2s, and IL-2s were going at three level. And um, of course, that meant that the air covers were never high, so the problem with the Super Charrier was pretty meaningless. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is the Russian version of the plane is not the same as the American one. First of all, the Russians used lighter planes. They took away most of the machine guns. The American versions had um, wing armament. The most most of the times, the Russian P-39s didn't have any armament on the wings, so those nasty gondolas under the wing were not there. Uh, which means less weight and better aerodynamics, both of them, which makes, uh, makes, of course, for a more efficient plane, aerodynamically speaking, and a faster plane, overall. 
And uh, finally, and probably the most important thing here, the Russians really, really have no respect for the mechanics of their planes. Actually, for the mechanics of everything. They simply extracted every single bit of performance they could out of their engines, as long as it didn't mean it would blow up in the face of the pilot. Let me put it in another way. The Western idea of a plane and a machine and an engine was, well, to make it powerful, to make it reliable, and to give it a relatively and decently long um, serviceable life. Uh, so an engine would be built, would be put in a plane, and maybe had 100 hours between uh, revision or maybe 50 hours between revisions and after say 200 hours of flight time in combat and uh, well in patrols and not in combat in sorties I mean flying time um, combat was n I mean, most of the flights of fighters in World War II didn't meet combat of course S uh, especially in the case of the Western Allies but Basically, it's, it's about that. I mean, it was meant to have an engine life. And the parameters of the engine, manifold pressure, RPMs, etc., were all um, written into the pilot manual for a given set of recommendations. So, use this power as cruise power. Use this as full military power. Don't, do not use it more than 30 minutes. Uh, and emergency ratings, uh, five minutes stops, not recommended over that. Well, those things were written to give the engine the contract service life, because of course this was all about contracts. Uh, the government asked for X numbers of engines and planes, and the producers were within bounds of a series of requirements on those contracts. So they had to deliver engines with a given tolerance of performance and engine uh, serviceability and reliability and life. So they had to make an engine that would have the power it should have within a um, percentage, of course. They had to deliver an engine that would um, have the service life um, it actually claimed it to have. So, the pilot's manuals were written by the builders to give their engines the service life they had promised to deliver. And if you went over those parameters and you abused your engine, what you would end up would be with an engine that would require an overhaul much sooner and would be ruined and uh, worn uh, much sooner. Um, so, for most of the part, I mean, this is the culture in the Western Air Forces. In the British, the American, the French, the Germans, the Italians, most of the Western world. However, now, let's put ourselves in the skin of a communist Russian. Which in 1941 saw how they were invaded and... Uh, Germans were in the gates of Moscow. And now let's be honest. When you are between the sword and the wall, you throw all regulations over the world and over the window. And fuck the engine life. <laughs> Basically. Actually, the Hermes is a very, very similar thing when the war was coming to an end. Uh, if you see the power specifications of the engines of the Germans in 1945, they were expecting to extract 2,600 uh, horsepower or out of a Jumo 213. And there's no way they could do that without accepting a really low service life. But really, they needed that power, they needed it now, and they needed it desperately. It never saw service, but it was going to enter service. The thing is, when you are desperate, that kind of stuff goes out of the window. And in Russia, it was that way. I mean, they never cared about engine life. There are some stories about... <laughs> they didn't even fit equipment. 
on, on, on the on the fighters. One German, one captured German. I think it was one captured German pilot. Uh, or was it a Soviet? No, it was a Soviet captured pilot when he saw um, what German fighters had. He was like, "Why do you want this? I mean, in in, in our air forces, a fighter has an expected expected lifetime of five, five, sorry. So why are you putting uh, radio navigation systems? Why are you putting uh, friendly foam um, relaying systems? Where are you putting electrical switches here? Where? No, don't do that because this plane is going to die in five um, battles. The Russians just built things at top speed uh, so they could build the lot and the much more they could in the shortest time. So they just fitted the most crappy and basic instruments to the fighters. So you have an altimeter, you will have a speedometer, you will have some uh, gauges for the engine, oil temperature, pressure, manifold pressure, etc. But nothing too fancy, nothing more than that. It was a Spartan to the extreme, because in Soviet Russia, planes were not expected to survive five sorties. So why are you going to spend a lot of things in a plane that's not going to last that long? It was the same in everything. I mean, the T-34s were effective, but so crude. I mean, so vast and so, so, so they weren't well built. They, they built a lot of them, but they weren't well built. Um, because um, at the time, the input and the influx was in numbers rather than in quality. And to be honest, with a reason, because they were in the verge of destruction. So I, in, during Barbarossa and during any 42 the USSR could very well have lost the war. So they were facing destruction. So in order to avoid that, they focused on numbers rather than quality, which is quite of the polar opposite of what Germany did uh, in any 45 But of course, Germany had a limited manpool while Russia had unlimited manpool. They had a lot of people to throw into the mid -green. Um However, I'm going off track here. The thing is that uh, Russians didn't build the Air Cobras, of course. They were given to them by Lend-Lease. But those um, planes that came through Lend-Lease, they didn't treat any better than they treated their own fighters. At all. At all. Um, so the era Corps are received, they lightened them, as I said, they retired the wing uh, weapons, which they saw as superfluous, they didn't need them, because they thought with the 37mm and the twin uh, 50 cals on the, on the calling was enough. Um, but they also extracted a lot more power from the Allison engine than what the Americans were doing. Of course, the Americans were extracting a given power of the engine because they expected it to have a given engine life and to survive for X time. But the Soviets didn't care at all for how long the damned engine survived. <laughs> they simply abused it. They allowed for higher manifold pressures, they allowed for higher power, and they didn't put any limit on the use of power other than what would be dangerous for the pilot. Uh, so, it's a, it's a case of abuse. They were abusing the engine, and of course, what resulted was a plane that was much faster than the standard era cover in the West. Because the standard era cover in the West was using decent uh, combat powers, but in Russia they were abusing the engine to the extreme, to the top, to the limit. You couldn't abuse it anymore. Because anyway, that plane in five, ga in five games, <laughs> oh in five stories, is going to be written off. Either by an accident from a trainee pilot, even shot down, maybe by AAA or a German fighter, or simply by degradation, by attrition, because it's been pushed so much into the limit that the engine is totally worn out and the plane can be ditched. So, 
I think it's not that the game portrays the P39K to have a better performance than the American one because Russian plane ha must have better performance. No, I think it's a case of the actual planes in, in USSR hands having better performances, but of course lasting much long, much shorter times, because after three, four, five stories, it will be over. <laughs> the, the engine will be so worn out that they wouldn't be able to use it anymore. So I, again, I think it's not a case of the developer has been biased towards the Russian. I think it's a case of something that little people know. Also, if you ask um, Russian pilots, and a lot of them were asked, they loved the Era Cobra. They loved it. And it's one of the most loathed planes in, in the West. Uh, you, I don't think you will find any um, American or British pilot who had a good opinion of the Era Cobra. The best quotes I have read about it is that it was not that bad. Let's put it this way. But really, no one, not none of them would say that it was a lovely machine, that it was a great fighter. None of them say that. However, go to Russia and ask them, and they say it was a great machine. It was a, had a great performance under 3,000 meters, which is the altitude where they flew at. That it could uh, tangle with the fair, better German fighters, of course, down there, um, etc. They loved it. I mean, they loved it. And uh, some of the big uh, Soviet uh, aces got most of the kills on Era Cobras, but it was because of that, because they would get on board of an Era Cobra with an engine which was super up to give powers that in the West they, it didn't. I mean, in the Western Air Forces, those powers weren't available because they would destroy the engine. But of course, what, what would happen was that a given pilot would fly a plane in three stories and then that plane would be ditched and sent to the scrapyard if it wasn't shot down uh, first. And the memory they have is of a plane with excellent performance. But of course, that happened because they were flying with maybe 200 extra horsepowers uh, than the Western versions of the Era Cobra and because they were using super up engines. So that's the whole problem, that's the whole issue. Um, again, it's not a case of developers being BSR, but of a real fact that happened that way. Of course, you will argue, okay, historically it was that way, but the plane was ditched after three um, uses. How do we simulate that? And how do we replicate that into the game? Well, it's a good question, because we can't. There's no reliability issues in the game. There's no availability issues in the game. So, yeah, you get the best without getting the worst. And it's mostly the same with the German planes, by the way. The late, very late German planes. Um, you get really good performance, but without any of the drawbacks. Planes that were really rare, that saw production in very pro uh, limited production runs, and you can spam them. So. This kind of something that's going on in the game right now, and not just in, in Russia. So, yeah, that's it for this question slash comment. And it's been a really long answer, to be honest. Next, move on. And last question is going to be Ram. I was wondering what is your opinion on non-historical skins like a bf 109 k with Tunisia, de Tunisia Desert Camo or an early war aircraft with late war camo schemes. It's okay for arcade, but I don't want to see it in historical or for real. I mean, a bf 9 k used the camo schemes it used. Um, a bf 9 e3 used the camo schemes it used. What I would like would be more vari variation between the camo schemes. More camos per plane. And probably the ability of the community to make camos for the planes and then get in to approve them. I would love to see that, but non-historical camos no no i mean this game after all is still meant to be historical to a point so if you are trying to bring historical performances and uh, what you do is to put them on planes that don't look the way they should doesn't make a huge lot of sense does it anyway that's going to be it for this week's uh, young with rome Questions. Now, 
I want to make a very special and um, well, re yeah, really special um, shout out and thank you for um, someone. You know, guys, I have a donation page for people who want to well um, help the channel and help me uh, running it, um, etc. Um, but this week I have had a very special donation. Um, not of money. This week there have been no money uh, donation, so that's why there's no t the usual list I usually run here. Um, but someone did something really cool. Um, Lasse Meyer. I don't know if I pronounce it that right, but this guy just went on and asked me to um, accept his friend uh, friend request in in Steam because he wanted to give me something, and he gifted me something, which was uh, the deluxe version of Arma 3. And that's a really, really nice stats. Really, really nice stats. So thank you, Lasse. Thank you a lot. That was really, really, really cool from you. Um, as for the game on itself, I'm playing it. I'm having fun with it a lot. But the problem is that my computer doesn't run it really well. I, I can play it without a problem. Don't take me wrong, and I'm doing so, and I'm having fun. But the problem is that I can't record. Uh, because the frames per second drop under 15 and the game becomes unplayable and the video is unwatchable but I'm playing it, I'm playing the campaign, the solo campaign and I will play it online as well and maybe hopefully, well, I know Sidestrafe um, uh, plays Arma so maybe um, at some point I join him and w he can record us playing the game um, so well uh, and maybe i find a way to record with uh, less uh, frames per second problem but really 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 thank you so much that was unexpected and that was really really cool from you guy so yep yeah, that's um, the huge thank you of this week um really when people just do that out of I mean, uh, all I do is put up videos for you guys to be entertained and from learn on War Thunder and maybe now with uh, Wargame, even though I'm not really good at Wargame yet and I hope to be somewhere someday, but I'm not yet. But really, I'm all, all I'm doing is just trying to help you out, guys, and I don't expect anything in return, and when it happens, it's really wonderful. So, yeah, that's going to be it for this uh, week's Young with Ram. Uh, as always, uh, don't forget, um, you have to put the questions down below in the comment section. Um, upvote the questions you want to see answered the best. Um, and uh, Also, uh, let me know if you really... Well, I'm at this point, I think the reception has been really good. Uh, people are watching them, people are upvoting them, the Wargame videos. Let me know, guys, if you want this to be a fix, fixture of the of the channel. I mean, my channel is War Thunder. It's focused on War Thunder and it's going to be focused on War Thunder. It's just that right now, because of the stated reasons, is not fun for me. But it's going to be War Thunder. But however, if you want me to play this game as well, when I start mm, um, playing War Thunder again and putting up content of War Thunder, let me know, because then I will also put um, videos of this of this game. These are right now placeholders until I start recording in War Thunder again. But if uh, you guys want, this will become as well an um, integral part of the of the channel. And I will put up uh, videos of uh, War Game on top of putting up uh, videos of War Thunder. So let me guys, let me know guys. <laughs> and as always, thank you very much for watching and. See you later.